In this video, I want to respond to a blog article entitled, Christian Husbands, You Don't Pay for the Milk When You Own the Cow. And I'm going to critique this blog from my feminist and atheist perspectives. The premise of this article is about um, men's entitlement to sex within marriage. And he makes the analogy to when you have a cow, you are entitled to the milk. And that's where he gets this lovely image that he used for the front of his article. In this video, I first want to introduce some concepts because I think what it's best to do is to lay out his worldview, explain his worldview first, and then show how his worldview appears within the article, and just how fucked up it is. I'm going to be applying a feminist and an atheist critique to this, and I just learned the term this week from somebody on Twitter, a uh, feminatheist, and I really like that neologism. So the idea here is that um, I'm going to combine a, an examination of power relations between the sexes as visualized by this author as normative and correct, but also apply uh, an atheist critique in that I want to completely undermine the proposition that these morals could come from a supernatural being, that there's no evidence for it, that it makes no sense, and actually the, the value system itself is completely messed up and should be overthrown, destroyed, removed from our societies entirely. And so that's where the combination of my feminism and my atheism come together. So it, maybe it's more like femin anti-theist anti <laughs> in that I, I'm definitely attacking um, the religions, but feminatheist is easier to say than femin anti-theist. The problem with a lot of modern day Christians in terms of recognizing the patriarchy that exists within the text is that they tend to project a lot of modern secular values onto their religion. So they project egalitarianism, they project anti-slavery, they project um, a n not great differences in hierarchies of power that clearly exist within the text. So in some ways it's it's kind of nice to see somebody who just spews um, unadulterated religious patriarchy on a website and advocates for this sort of, again, Bronze Age lifestyle, because it gives you a real sense of how these values are being transposed and transported into the 21st century. And also one other thing, the author is anonymous. He hides his identity, he hides his name, and so it's very difficult. I can't give you any information about him other than he says he's a Christian male in his 40s, has been divorced. Um, so I, I just gonna have to call in the author because that's the only name that I can I have available in a previous video on patriarchy I used these slides and I'm going to put them up again so that we can just remind ourselves of what the power structures are when we compare the religious patriarchal structure to our modern secular egalitarianism and as you can see there's a t top bit that is privileged where you get god on the very top and then men and god is are closer to men in terms of power and god gives men power over women and children so even though men are subservient and i'll talk a little bit about how god the concept of god manipulates and terrorizes men into activities in a little bit it's important to sort of see that the whole power structure is based on God's power being handed down. And therefore, any transgression in that water flow of power is seen in terms of the biblical text or the biblical interpretation of the text as sinning against God. So any attempts to move toward egalitarianism is a violation of God's will. That is messed up. We're gonna contrast that with egalitarianism, again, which is a secular basis for organizing society, which starts with the premise of like humanism, that all human beings are equal, and in terms of their rights in a secular society, we're all entitled to the same rights and privileges and benefits as everybody else that we agree enjoys those benefits. So if it's an unemployment benefit or some sort of protection against discrimination, everyone should enjoy those equally. That's flat level of rights and equality is obviously very different from the pyramid scheme where power flows downwards, and they're completely incompatible. There's nothing you can do to make egalitarianism fit within patriarchy, and there's no way you can adapt patriarchy to make it more compatible with egalitarianism. They simply cannot coexist. The sexual expectations of women that I infer look like this. A girl's body, a woman's body, is under her father's control first, she has the responsibility of suppressing and denying her own sexual desires. She is also responsible for resisting all male interest and to take moral ownership for any sexual activity she engages with in a man in a way that he is not morally culpable. And she can be punished or will be punished for premarital sexual activity with death according to the biblical text. 
So there is no punishment for premarital sex for young boys, for, you know, for boys, you know, teen boys, or for any men. Whereas there is uh, a punishment for women who are the other half of that act, that's death. So the first part of a girl's life growing up is to avoid sex, avoid sex, avoid sex, stay pure, don't be sexy, don't be, um, don't kiss boys, don't do anything that would damage your virginity. If you do, we'll kill you. And then once she is married, now her body is under her husband's control. Again, she has to deny her own sexual wishes in terms of having sex when she doesn't want to, because as a wife, she is required to accept any initiated sexual activities by her husband. If she does not accept the sexual activity, then she's punished. So her roles are completely reversed as soon as she gets married. Before marriage, it's nothing, resist everything, and be punished if there's a transgression with a man. And after marriage, um, then she, her body again is not her own. She has to submit herself, be open sexually, be submissive sexually, and she's punished if she doesn't have sex with her husband. So that is the worldview that this author is operating within. The sexual expectations of men are different because of their power location within that pyramid structure I showed you. So men do have control over their own bodies their whole lives. They can have sex outside of marriage. The Bible is pretty clear that lots of men, uh, the founders, the patriarchs, had sex with their slaves. They had concubines. They're, they had you no know, prostitutes and, and used prostitutes. None of these result in the death penalty. So men are allowed to have sex with women unless it's a rape charge, basically without consequence. It's women who bear the consequence for men's sexual activity. And if they do, of course, violate that, they're not really violating the woman, they're violating the other man. So they should respect the man, the father or the husband, uh, as, you know, as men and not mess with their property. And that's where the social punishments and the social pressures come from, is within the peer group, not within the women that they're having sex with. After marriage, men are encouraged to see their wives' bodies as their own property, not as belonging to their wives. Basically, the men, you know, your husband owns your body as a, you're being a wife, and you're just allowed to occupy it. But, you know, you're an inconvenience, your will is an inconvenience in terms of your sexual availability, according to this author. In the author's worldview, men's sexual needs or preferences must come first because he's the head of the household and he's got, um, God's power behind him, and therefore to decline him or refuse him or put him off is a threat to that power structure in the author's eyes. And so women are always supposed to be about submissing, being submissive, and submitting themselves. And this article deals with the power struggle when a woman doesn't want to be so submissive. Before I move on to show the obvious fucked up things that are said about women in this article, I want to point out the mentality that it's encouraging in men. So I want to talk about how men in this system are under threat. Men here are required by the biblical God to be a dictator in the house. If you do any kind of power sharing, that is seen as power loss, and that power loss violates the will of God. So there's a real tension here between a man actually exercising that kind of power and giving up that power being seen not as a move toward egalitarianism, but a sin in the eyes of God. It requires men to be in control of women's sexual activities. So fathers are viewed as accountable for their daughter's activities. And this structure of knock-on responsibilities creates a situation where, again, if a man does not impose his power over women in his family, then he is violating the will of God and allowing others to violate the will of God. So the responsibility for this um, falls on the man coming from God's requirements and also coming from the obvious resistance of autonomous female beings who don't want to be controlled. So again, I mean, it's, it's always better to be in a position of power than to not be in a position of power. But here, men biblically um, are wrestling with the idea of every time they give something up to their wives, are they violating the will of God? Should they just be hardcore dictators? And that's pretty much what the texts encourage. Patriarchy is built on assumption of authority over others, the use of bullying, the use of coercion, the use of humiliation, and sometimes even the use of force. The author of the article mentions that there is no such thing as marital rape in the Bible, and though he does not encourage rape, technically, I mean, it might be against men's laws, man's laws, that marital rape exists, but you're okay when it comes to God, guys. 
This is a mentally and emotionally unhealthy way to organize family relationships. And just to state the obvious again, it's why we need to replace religious patriarchy with egalitarianism and secular notions of human equality and rights available to all. The article starts with him discussing the concept of when you buy the cow, getting the milk for free. And he articulates this thing that I mentioned before about the different moral standards and obligations based on sex. The author starts with the idea that when you give sex up before marriage, this leads to declining marriage rates. And when he was growing up, the pastors would talk about when you buy the cow, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? And then going on to talk to the teenage girls in particular about how it's their responsibility to keep the boys from having sex. And that people today might complain that this is really unfair and that there's responsibilities on both sides. But the author of the article goes on to point out that, well, really, guys having sex outside of marriage, while not ideal, it certainly wasn't as bad. I mean, if you look at the Bible, as I pointed out, concubines, prostitutes, sex with slaves. The Bible had gives instructions on how to kidnap foreign women and keep them as your sex slaves, the rights that they are then entitled to in your household. So clearly, if there's some protect protection there, and the man takes on that responsibility, then that's God's will, because that's what it says in the Bible. He writes, However, if you examine the scriptures closely, you will see that God places the greater burden on the woman to refuse the man. In the Old Testament law, a woman could be executed for not being a virgin when she was married, whereas there was no such punishment for a man that was not a virgin. I realize this goes against our modern gender equality ideas, but the Bible supports no such notion. And he's right. The Bible does not recognize women as equal, autonomous, self-determining human beings. I'm just going to assume that I don't have to explain fully why this double standard of sexual activity is completely unfair and pretty outrageous, and one other thing, completely idiotic. If, let's say that um, you have a system where when teens hang out and they go into the store and they shoplift, only the girls will get busted for shoplifting, but the boys won't if they're in a group together and they do it. Well, what is the disincentive for the group that doesn't have consequence to stop its behavior? And the idea that this could come from an all-knowing, omnipotent, intelligent being, that this is the moral system that this being came up with, is pretty laughable. A lot of this author's focus in this article is about when women in a marriage do not want to give up sex to their husbands, and how this is sinful behavior, and how men should confront and basically intimidate women or shame them into allowing them to have sex. Not citing any data, he makes up this sort of sexual stereotype that when sex first starts, the woman lets the man have sex whenever she he wants, he gets some, um, you know, a taste, he gets the milk for free, it's basically, you know, on tap, but then she starts to say, oh, I want help with the kids, or oh, you know, I want to help um, make some decisions in the household, and power, power dimensions outside the bedroom start to play a role inside the bedroom. This, in the author's eyes, is a sin. Men are entitled to have sex with their wives, and any time he bargains with her for something else, then that's paying for it. He's, you know, women are a low-cost sex provider within marriage. That is one of the benefits of men being married, is they have access to on-tap sex. Whether or not the woman wants it is irrelevant. He premises this sexual access on male ownership of his wife's body, and he says, Biblically speaking, a wife does belong to her husband. Men paid a bride price and won the terms for husband, I'm sick, and won the terms for husband in the original languages of the Bible is Baal, which means owner or master. And he quotes here Proverbs 31. And then weirdly, 1 Peter 3 says, oh, I think he's quoting from 1 Peter 3. He's not the best writer, this guy. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord or master. So that's it, ladies. When you get married, you are no longer your own person. You're the property of your husband. The author's premise is that whenever a woman denies her husband sex, he's denying him access to his property. Even if it's delaying it or somehow making it conditional, these are all completely wrong. He cites a personal anecdote. I once knew a Christian couple where the only way the man got sex from his wife was when he did the dishes and picked up the house. I don't think it's wrong for a husband to do these kinds of things for his wife, but these things should never be a prerequisite for sex. Doing your share around the house is not buying sex. It's doing your share around the house. 
and the idea that somehow she's supposed to keep all the house you know, completely tidy and do the kids and keep everything organized and have enthusiastic energetic sex with him is really just shows the complete lack of context for what a woman's life is like and what modern marital relationships are like. A thing to notice in this is how often sex is linked with power. The author's worldview sees sex and power relations as completely intertwined. Sex for a man is sex with the property that he controls. It's a demonstration of his power. Any concession to the wife or any condition to his access is not seen as some sort of marital negotiation or a problem that needs to be dealt with, but a violation of the will of God. That's messed up. The author's religious patriarchy is encouraging men to act like dictators in the home and to see any aff um, affront as an affront not only to himself but to God and a threat to his eternal salvation if he does not then quash this and use more power and force to stop these negotiations or this contest from coming out into some kind of compromise. And I'm not making this up. He actually says this, right? And I'll quote. What all these different prerequisites have in common is they require a man to transfer his God-given authority over his home, his children, and his wife, and yes, even to his wife's body to his wife. Only if they do the bidding of their wives will she give them the goods. I think that kind of stands on its own um, as offensive and completely idiotic. But again, you'll see here how it's nothing about her needs or her desires or her wishes as a human being. Anything she does to challenge male authority is a threat to him and a violation, sort of an attack on him and a violation of the will of God. This means that women can never do anything but submit. They never have an opportunity to counter negotiate this power dynamic. Their only option is submit, submit, submit. That is slavery. His advice for dealing with a woman who doesn't want to make herself sexually available is to rebuke her, to sit her down like she's some sort of moronic child, and point out all the passages in the Bible that demonstrate his power over her, and to continue to try to brainwash her until she submits and gives him sexual access. And it's also important to realize that he tells men that women who do this are behaving sinfully. So a woman who tries to act, actualize some sexual autonomy over her body and when she has sex is actually committing a sin. And even wanting to control when you have sex is a violation of the will of God. So I'll quote here. You must see this as God sees it, as an act of rebellion against your authority over her and her body and by extension, as an act of rebellion against God himself. Should you have relations with your wife after such a confrontation when you rebuke her and tell her that she's being sinful? The author writes, I believe the answer is yes, if she yields to you, even with the wrong attitude. So let's just imagine this. If a man wants to have sex with his wife and she doesn't want to have sex with him, he should sit her down at the kitchen table and open up the Bible, berate her for violating his rights over her body, and also berate her for being sinful um, in the eyes of God and um, you know, being abhorrent in the eyes of God and spitting in the face of God in terms of the authority that he has handed down on earth. Now get in the bedroom and get naked and let me have sex with you. And she does that. Should you have sex with her at that point? Yeah, even if she, if she yields to you even with the wrong attitude. According to this guy, that's the will of God. And no, I'm not really going off on a complete tangent here or making accusations that are unwarranted. He writes, When I first had to confront my wife with these types of issues, I would confront her and then just leave the sex to happen another night because, after all, I, like most men, don't prefer to have sex with my wife when she acts grumpy about it. You should never be having sex with somebody who's grumpy about it. And in fact, grumpiness is a sign that they don't want to have sex with you. But of course, that doesn't matter to this author. Submission matters. The author writes, I realize that sex still needs to occur, that sex is not about being in the mood, and it's not about feelings, it's about doing what's right. But the truth is there will be many times when we don't have all that in place, but we must still have sex. God wants us to do the right thing, even when we don't feel like it. He goes on to say that this probably won't be a one-time thing. You'll probably have to demand sex from your wife on multiple occasions because her 
will to be a free human being won't be broken just after one time, but that it's important to do that. And he ends the article asking the question, can my Christian wife ever say no to my sexual advances? Basically, his idea is that the answer to this question is a Christian wife should never ask for, never give her husband a flat no, but she can humbly and gently ask for a delay. It's not her body. Don't you get that? So she can't give, actually refuse you. What she can do is ask for like, oh, can I get a couple days off? So being a good Christian husband, you should take a rain check, but you should also expect that that rain check is going to get paid because it's not really about love. It's about doing the will of God and the will of God wants you to have sex, even when you're not in the mood and even if she's not in the mood. So submission is better than love. The author has written other blog entries on this and the next two that follow on are Is a husband selfish for having sex with his wife when she is not in the mood? And how to handle your wife's sexual refusals. He's apparently not done and neither am I. I hope you've enjoyed this feminatheist critique. I've been Christy, you've been awesome, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.